Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akhri Dumrali, the headlines. A United Nations inspection team leaves for Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. European Union foreign policy chief Joseph Borrell says foreign ministers are unlikely to unanimously back a ban on visas for all Russians. Plus, President Vladimir Zelensky promises to recapture Donbass, saying that he has not forgotten any of Ukrainian cities. An inspection team from the UN nuclear watchdog is on its way to Ukraine's embattled Zaporizhia nuclear power plant. The organization's head, Rafael Grossi, who is the director general of the International Atomic Energy Agency, says the team is expected to arrive at the plant later this week. The nuclear plant has been occupied by invading Russian troops since March. Fighting around the facility in Ukraine's southeast has led to mounting global concern over the safety and security of the site. Ukraine and Russia have accused one another of shelling the area. In the meantime, the International Atomic Energy Agency is seeking to gain access to the facility, which Ukrainian staff are operating under the order of Russian forces. This is a situation that the IAEA has said threatens the safety of Europe's largest nuclear power plant. The mission led by IEA chief Rafael Grossi is expected to assess any damage from recent shelling near the power plant, which Russia and Ukraine have blamed on each other. And the blame game is continuing. Russia and Ukraine traded fresh accusations over the weekend of shelling the Russian-controlled power plant in Zaporizhia. Russia's defense ministry had accused Ukrainian forces of shelling the plant three times in the last 24 hours. 17 artillery rounds were fired on the nuclear facility, with four shells hitting the roof of a storage facility for nuclear fuel. But the radiation level at the plant is said to remain normal and the technical condition of the plant is monitored and maintained by its staff of technicians. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, a Russian special force was stationed at the perimeter of the nuclear power plant and no heavy weapons were deployed near it. Ukraine's state nuclear company Energo Artem however blamed Russia for shelling the plant, claiming the damage is currently being ascertained. The Ukrainian government has terminated the agreement on scientific, technical and economic cooperation in the field of nuclear power with Russia. Zaporizhia's authorities have handed out iodine tablets in the city's eastern Kotievsky district as fears of a nuclear accident remain high. Zaporizhia is located 55 kilometers northeast from Europe's largest nuclear power plant in Anahoda, currently occupied by Russia. Regional Governor Alexander Staruk said that Russian forces struck residential buildings in the region's main city about a two and a half hour drive from the plant and the town of Orykiv for the east. Local resident Anastasia said it was the second time she had obtained iodine tablets since the war broke out six months ago. In early March, fierce fighting around the plant broke out after which Russia captured the premises and the nearby town of Enahoda. The nuclear plant remains close to the front line and has come under repeated fire in recent weeks, raising fears of a nuclear disaster. Russia and Ukraine continue to accuse each other of shelling it. And Russian forces hit workshops at a motor search factory in that region, talking about Zaporizhia, where helicopters are being repaired. Russia's defense ministry said Russian forces destroyed fuel storage facilities in the Dipno region as well, which supplied the Ukrainian army in the Donbass region. And in the Ural village of Boronovo, about 1,300 kilometers east of Moscow in Russia's Udmurt region, every life goes slowly with few people seen in the streets. Six months into the conflict in Ukraine, villagers speak that they did not like what was happening, but did not believe Russia or the Russians were to blame. 84-year-old Nadetse says life is far from easy as she stood in front of her house in Boronovo where she's been living since she was born. Uh, Matseda worked for 37 years as a dairy farm hand on a Soviet collective farm or Kolkas. She receives a monthly pension of about $570. It's a good pension in a region of Russia where the monthly average is about $700. She's among many residents who believe Russian President Vladimir Putin is not 
to blame. Let's speak now to Dr. Raymond Ekpobodo, General Secretary of Nigerians in Diaspora Organization, NATO in Russia. Good morning to you, Doc. Thank you for your time. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Let's, uh, let's begin with uh, what has been happening with uh, this uh, power plant uh, in Ukraine, which is under Russian control, uh, but which uh, the IAEA is now expected to visit. Do you, do you have affairs uh, about what is going on, the shelling, the counter-shelling, uh, both sides blaming each other uh, for what is going on there? Okay. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for inviting me to your China. And of course, talking about what is happening between Russia and Ukraine, these are technical issues which I'm not in position to explain to your <clears throat> China. So in that case, I will suggest that maybe you take me to other questions than to put my What I was in asking, uh, Doctor, perhaps you didn't hear me very well. I wasn't talking about the technical parts. I was asking you about fear. Um, you don't need to be a technical expert to know if you have fears that if radiation leaks out of that plant, which is a fear of everyone, uh, you, there might be a really big problem at hand. Many people remember Chernobyl in 1986. Uh, and then, of, of course, uh, Fukushima in Japan more recently. I'm asking, do you have fears about a nuclear accident, that there could be a nuclear accident if the fighting continues around the plant? Of course, if uh, the fighting continues and uh, there's a nuclear explosion, uh, everyone should have a fear towards that because uh, we know what the uh, uh, nuclear weapon is all about, which will cause a lot of uh, disaster to uh, uh, human, which uh, not only human, also to other uh, things that are living uh, living things. So it is a fear to everyone to see that uh, the war is still continuing to that extent where we are talking about the nuclear weapon, the explosion of nuclear weapon. So I don't actually advise or suggest that uh, the war should continue to that level, whereby nuclear weapon will be used to attack each other. Let's, uh, let's come to Russia itself. Uh, you are uh, an official, a top-ranking official of uh, NIDO in Russia. And uh, I, I want to ask uh, about uh, what is happening in Russia itself. Um, and uh, Nigerians who are, you know, doing various things in Russia, schooling, professionals like yourselves and others. How have you been coping with um, the situation of this uh, conflict six months uh, down the line? Yeah, uh, of course. There are a lot of things that have happened uh, within this six months because uh, the truth is that uh, uh, many people have uh, been affected with this uh, uh, sanction within, between Russia and uh, Ukraine, especially those uh, students, because now it is difficult for them to do transaction to also make payment for their school fees. So because of the sanction, they cannot make payment directly from uh, Nigeria. So they find it difficult to make payment. But however, Russia have been a grant trying to open different NGOs to assist uh, foreigners who are studying here to make their studies smoothly. So like Lido in Russia, we have been also a grant trying to make uh, some mechanism or grant with the Russia government to make sure that uh, our Nigerians, they are able to uh, make payment for their studies. Talking about the aspect of living in Russia, things are normal in Russia. Like me, for example, I'm not feeling the uh, the the impact of the war because everything is normal. Because uh, most importantly, there are food out there. Students can go out and buy food, and also the price is a little bit high, of course. But um, they are still trying to work on it to make sure by January, which Putin said that uh, everything will become normal, price of food will become normal. So that is it, sir. Let's uh, let's look a bit more at what you said about. Um the Nigerians, uh, the Nigerians who are there and uh, how uh, NIDO has been helping out. I know that at the beginning of the conflict, there were many students who left Ukraine for Russia, and many of them were trying in some instances to see whether they could get schools in Russia, you know, to continue their studies, either in the meantime while the conflict went on or more permanently uh, because nobody knew uh, that uh, exactly when the conflict would end. How are those ones surviving now? 
Have many of them left for other countries or back home to Nigeria? Uh, how are the ones who have remained in Russia, how, how, how are they coping? I mean, when we put aside the issue of fees, which you've already addressed. Okay, fine. Like for those who migrated from Ukraine because of the war and they decided to stay back in Russia to continue their study, um, in the normal system of Russia, Russia uh, do normally offer them, them scholarship. So many of them, they have been given scholarship to study in different universities across Russia Federation, and uh, we uh, also know many of them. So for those that are not interested to continue their study in Russia, many of them also flew to Nigeria and different countries within the European uh, uh, continent. So, so far, so good for those that are in Russia that uh, came to Russia, they are going to continue their study, normal study, as from the 1st of uh, September. 2022 with the academic year. Good. So 1st of September 2022, uh, those ones are going to study. Now that is for students. How about the professionals? Uh, you mentioned that someone in your position, of course, you were not in Ukraine. You have been in Russia. But how about the professionals who had to also leave and move to Russia? What Have, have you been able to do anything uh, as NIDO to assist them either to settle down or to look for work or for those of them who wanted to move on to other countries or come back to Nigeria? Have you been able to do anything to help them? Yeah, for those professionals like me, for example, uh, the ones that move to Russia, because uh, when you compare Russia to other countries, the job opportunity is not there when you compare Russia to other European countries. But it's a decision, it's individual. For those who agree to stay in Russia, they are able to find some little job to, uh, to do. And for those that are not interested to, start, uh, to stay in Russia, they move to Nigeria where they can find a good job for living. And for others, they also move to a part of the Europe to look for a job for good living. The, the question of um, food supplies, because when we talk about uh, situations like this, you have a lot of refugees uh, who move from place to place, away from the conflict area, looking for safety. Uh, many of them, of course, moved to Russia uh, in that regard. Has there been any pressure on services like health services, food supplies, medical supplies, and so on, for those who had been living in Russia before the conflict with all this influx of people. For example, if I take NIDO as an organization, NIDO Russia would be looking after Nigerians who were in Russia. But now with the situation, a lot more people have moved over and NIDO is expected to help them. Yeah, when you talk about the food, Food is necessity for everyone. And uh, the, one of the things I will thank Russia because um, since this war started, uh, there are surplus, there are food. Uh, there's no scarcity of food. So NIDO has also made itself available for Nigerians, trying to assist Nigerians who are in need of food from different uh, uh, cities. If there are people who have gone elsewhere, um, either Poland, Hungary, and so on, uh, to seek for refuge, uh, would you encourage them to come to Russia, where uh, professionals like yourselves are, you are well established there, and uh, probably you know the ropes uh, to help them settle down? Uh, of course. I will definitely assist uh, Nigeria who are interested to come to Russia because uh, coming to Russia we also help them to uh, come out from this uh, the whole uh, situation. Because like me, personally, I'm in Russia, and uh, I think uh, for all this why I've been uh, doing things uh, in Lomani to assist Nigeria. So for those who are interested to come to Russia, I think we are on ground to assist them to get a, a good living. Mm. My final question to you will be about uh, the weather. So much has been made about uh, or made of uh, the coming winter. And uh, in many parts of uh, Europe, there are so many people who are talking about preparing for winter uh, that, and that all indices are that perhaps this winter may be in fact colder than uh, the previous ones. How are you preparing uh, in Russia? Uh, I think uh, I've been in Russia for some time, for a very uh, uh, long time now. And uh, winter should not be a problem to us because uh, we are used to the winter. As I'm talking to you, we have a very 
good weather, the weather is normal. Talking about winter, we are prepared. We know that when it comes to winter, there's going to be winter and we are prepared for winter. And uh, uh, I don't think uh, winter should be a problem to, to us. We are used to it. Indeed, please do continue to stay safe. Dr. Raymond Ekpobodo, General Secretary, Nigerians in Diaspora Organization in Russia. Thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says that Donbass was almost destroyed by Russian strikes and that Russia had absolute disregard for the value of life. During his nightly address, Mr. Zelensky also said that he held a meeting with representatives of the defense and security sector, but couldn't disclose the details of the issues considered. Russian artillery fired at Ukrainian towns across the river from the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant overnight according to local officials, adding to residents' anguish as reports of shelling around the plant fueled fears of a radiation disaster. Russia's defense ministry said there was more Ukrainian shelling of the same plant over the past 24 hours, just a day after Moscow and Kiev traded accusations over who was posing the greatest grave international concern by attacking the plant. In the meantime, mm -hmm. President Zelensky is confident Ukraine will recapture Donbass, which is now almost fully seized by Russian forces. He said, quote, we have not forgotten and will not forget any of our cities and any of our people. According to him, the ability to live will return, the opportunity to live safely and happily. He says the Ukrainian flag will be set up in Donetsk, Golovka, Mariupol, in all cities of Donbass, as of areas, as well as all areas under Russian occupation in Kharkov, Zaporizhia, and Kherson regions, as well as a Crimea. Sales to come on the program. Russia is to launch UN bond sales. It is a moment. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. The Russian Defense Ministry says that Russian forces have struck a number of Ukrainian defense industrial facilities, while the Ukrainian military claims that it forced Russian forces to retreat in Kharkiv and other directions. The Defense Ministry spokesperson, uh, General Igor Konoshenkov, said the Russian aerospace forces used high-precision weapons to strike the workshop of Madasek Company in the city of Zaporizhia, where Ukrainian Air Force helicopters were being repaired. Russian forces hit an oil storage depot in Dnipropetrov that supplies Ukrainian forces in Donbass with fuel. Russian forces also used high-precision weapons to strike a Ukrainian reserve training center in Slovyansk. In addition, Russian air defense forces intercepted shells fired by the multiple rocket launcher system in Donetsk and other places and shot down a number of Ukrainian drones. The general staff of the Ukrainian armed forces says that the Ukrainian army forced the withdrawal of Russian troops in the direction of Kharkiv, Slavyansk, and Adivka, which suffered losses in the directions uh, of those two cities. The Ukrainian army also repelled several Russian attacks in the direction of Bakhmut. The EU will encounter major challenges due to the sanctions it imposed on Russia over the conflict in Ukraine, and that's according to the bloc's top diplomat, Joseph Borrell. The issue was raised during Mr. Borrell's interview with the Australian media, pointing out that many people in their countries are skeptical about the anti-Russian measures. The diplomat claims that the sanctions are working and that Russia is, quote, in trouble. However, Mr. Borrell also acknowledged that the EU is facing major challenges in the short term because of the sanctions and that there is no denying that the price of gas is rising. According to him, European citizens, quote, must be willing to pay the price for freedom because the war in Ukraine isn't only a war of the Ukrainians, but a war of freedom. Meanwhile, European Union foreign ministers are unlikely to unanimously back a ban on visas for all Russians when they meet later this week. Mr. Borrell, who we've just been quoting, says he does not think that to cut the relationship with the Russian civilian population will help and that this idea will have the required unanimity. The foreign ministers would need to reach unanimous agreement to implement a ban, which would be the bloc's latest action intended to publish, uh, punish Russia over its invasion of Ukraine. Instead, they are expecting to back suspending a visa facilitation agreement with Moscow when they meet on Tuesday in Prague. 
the move would make it significantly more difficult and expensive for Russians to travel. A senior U.S. official involved in the talks told the Financial Times it would be inappropriate for Russian tourists to stroll in our cities and on our marinas. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says that evil will not have the last word in the conflict in Ukraine. She was speaking at an event in the Thais Christian religious community in eastern France and said she was quoting the words of Brother Alice, the prior of the community. She added that if Russia stops fighting, there will be no war in Ukraine. But if Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no more Ukraine. Moscow and Kiev traded fresh accusations about shelling of various areas uh, in uh, Ukraine. If Russia stops fighting, there will be no more war in Ukraine. But if Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no more Ukraine. So standing up for peace today means standing with the people of Ukraine. Ukrainians are fighting for their democracy, for their self-determination, for the respect of the human dignity. Ukrainians are fighting for their survival, but also for our European values. And I'm confident, just like you said, Brother Alois, that, and I quote you, in Ukraine, evil will not have the last word. The Ukrainian army has released footage showing German-made Panzerhut's 2,000 howitzers firing shells. The missiles are one of the most powerful artillery weapons in the Bundeswehr inventories and can hit targets at a distance of up to 40 kilometers. German Chancellor Olaf Scholz had promised Ukraine on its Independence Day, that's August the 24th, that his country would continue to deliver weapons month after month and train more Ukrainian soldiers. Most of the heavy weapons NATO countries have sent to Ukraine so far are Soviet-built arms still in the inventories of East European NATO member states. But the United States and some other allies have started to supply Kiev with Western howitzers. Kiev has previously said it needs 1,000 howitzers, 500 tanks and 1,000 drones, amongst other heavy weapons, to repel uh, Russian troops. Let's talk now to David uh, Isevokun, who is a consultant researcher with the People of African Descent Link, Padlink, who joins us uh, from Mordehen, Westerfelen region in Germany. Good morning uh, to you, uh, uh, David, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's, let's start off uh, with the point that we just uh, raised. I'm... Uh, wondering what you make of the fact that uh, it does appear as if Germany is now uh, ready and willing and able uh, to supply uh, Ukraine with more uh, critical weapons, uh, as we've just been reporting. Uh, do you fear, because you are in Germany, do you fear that uh, this may draw Germany perhaps uh, even more into the conflict, uh, which it was reluctant to do uh, earlier? Well, you see, uh, in, in Africa, we are, a wealth, we are a wealth of knowledge when it comes to culture and tradition. There is something, there's something that we usually say, if you, if you don't want to buy a, a market, make an uprising. up. So when, you, when they have decided to go into this war, from the moment that they began to support the Ukrainians, the war actually had begun implicitly. And so um, I have seen the way they have been going on with um, with um, with um, uh, uh, giving them armaments and uh, providing weapons and all that, the way they've been stalling things, moving back and forth, it is their strategy owing to their history. They are not out of place. You should understand that Germany has been has been the center has been in the center point of two world wars, and then you should also understand that Germany was partitioned. And um, the Soviet side, you know, they had the Soviet side and they had the Western governed side. So you should see that all these ideas and all these, all these historical um, uh, precedents or what you want to call them, they are coming into play now. They are coming into play. 
So, so I will not see that as you know stalling or like they are slow or like they are this or that. But what I would see it as is they are only trying to apply themselves to what their people want. They want it's a democracy, and there are divergent objectives, divergent views, and so they are working towards making sure that they stabilize things. But at the end of the day, you can see that they have begun to provide the Ukrainians with weapons. And, um, you know, just as with the German bureaucracy, the bureaucracy is really, really, really very slow and thorough. It's very slow and thorough. But once you get through the bureaucracy, you discover that everything, you know, will just go smoothly. That's that's my uh, uh, objective view, you know, on that. Now, uh, you're, you're a consultant researcher with Padlink, uh, which uh, zeroes in on uh, people of African descent. Uh, much earlier on in the conflict, near the beginning, when people were fleeing uh, in all directions for safety when the conflict started, um, there were, as at, as at then, there were accusations uh, that, uh, you know, there was some level of racism involved with all, all this movement, particularly against uh, people of uh, uh, African descent, who there were quite a number of them uh, in Ukraine uh, at the start of the conflict. Uh, we heard stories about them being pulled off trains uh, and not being given space to be able to escape, whereas people from other places were and all of that. And that even as refugees in other countries, they have not really been uh, uh, completely treated well. Now, this is a story that uh, seems to have dropped to the bottom of the news pile while emphasis in pla is placed on the war and weaponry and all of that and even the nuclear yeah, power plant. Yeah. So yeah. that brings yeah. up the issue of some level of institutionalized racism against uh, African decent people. What can you tell us about that uh, from your research over the last six months? Well, what doesn't, I'll start off by saying that what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. That is the that is the aspect that I'm I'm actually going to hinge on, you know, to 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 continue my own uh, uh, contribution. Um, I believe I believe that the major problem of the African peoples, you know, the major problem is the media. The major problem is the media. You see, all over the world, the media spearheads, you know, several you know ideologies. They protect their citizens, they do propaganda, they do systemic information dissemination. But when it comes to Africa, you know, we find ourselves lagging behind. And because we don't value our own people, others won't value us. That is just the reality of it. You remember, Ladi, you know, at the beginning of our, of our relationship in March, you remember I was on your program. And I told you that we had just escaped the war in Ukraine. Yes, we did escape the war in Ukraine. Yes, you can see me look, smiling right now. Then I wasn't smiling. I was looking. I was. I was really ready, you know, to get headlong with people. That that. Yeah, that, you were. That if I remember to... correctly, that 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 time you were talking to us from just outside a train station. Well, you see, so so basically, we were. It was it was it was a very traumatic issues. Uh, I mean, uh, issue. It was a very traumatic issue having to travel with three children, my wife and my and my younger brother, and and we moved into into Germany. And the kind of racism that we experienced is quite uncommon. Now we're talking about the Ukrainian people, and they're saying, "Oh, well, it's a, it's a war of freedom. It's a war of freedom." The most baffling aspect of it all is how can you, a nation fighting against oppression, you are oppressing other people. This, this, is, this is actually what I will not accept and I cannot understand. And the world has kept quiet on this issue. I remember Padlink. Padlink is, is an organization that Nigeria and Nigerians should appreciate and thank. We should thank them. When we came in, Padlink decided, okay, these people, where are they from? Who are they? We are people of African descent. We're from Nigeria. And this was what the, the, the uh, chairman of Padlik uh, uh, 
um, Komolafe Larry. This was what he did. He simply took us in into as a project, and it began to nurture us, you know, to normalcy. And this is what our governments back home should have been doing. Now, I know they are trying their best in one way or the other, but the real people that should help them to actualize the vision and the mission of catering for Nigerians in diaspora, displaced Nigerians in diaspora, the people that should be able to help them are not really within their reach. The real people are not really within their reach. The people that have the, the real interest, that has the interest that had, they are not within their reach. People like organizations like Padme are not being given the right support. Because I saw this, I, I, I was an activist. You remember the last time we spoke, I told you that I was an activist in Ukraine. And, um, and that brings me to the point where I would explain my personality. I will not flatter people. I will not give you publicity that you do not deserve. I will not flatter people and I will not give you publicity that you do not deserve. I remember that the Nigerian government was saying that they were evacuating people. And I was asking, you are evacuating people from what? You are evacuating people to what? And how are you evacuating these people? Today, I have been vindicated because most of those students, they weren't evacuated actually. They were actually airlifted. Not, there's a difference between evacuation and airlifting. They were airlifted. They were airlifted from safe, safe uh, European countries. And the question that I would ask you, after you evacuated, you evacuated these students to Nigeria, how are they faring? ASU has been on strike for how many months? How is the life of those people fair? Some of these parents, some of them have begun to fall sick because they had to think of how much they put together, the properties that they sold in order to send the student out, you know, to, to get a, a, a good education. And then they are back home, purportedly being helped by a government that says, yeah, we, 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 we are your government. So basically, these are some of the, we need to be strategic about certain things. We need to be strategic about certain things. When we are doing things, let's be strategic and let's be proactive. I am not saying that the Nigerian government has not done anything right. But what I'm saying is that the right hands should be employed. The right people should be sought after. You shouldn't go after people that are just after their own personal interest, you know? So basically, I, I think I will stop there because, Ladi, I think you would have some more questions for me. Well, actually, the time permits me to ask you just one more question because uh, I also know that previously you had spoken about uh, how Nigeria uh, could, uh, in some ways, look at this situation the way other countries, uh, some other countries, with some of the resources we have, uh, are and um, kind of like maximize our potential, if you like, uh, because I, I, I don't like to use the phrase uh, cashing. Uh, I prefer maximize our potential uh, because, you know, this is a situation that is fraught with uh, uh, danger for others. But I, 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 six months down the line, when we had that conversation, have you seen any evidence that um, we perhaps are looking in that direction at all? Well, I have seen some evidence, but you see, like as usual with Nigeria, they will just hear, I believe someone must have heard it from, from the channel's news when we were, we were discussing it the last time, and then someone in power, I mean, or someone in government, and then they just, oh, 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 yes, yes, we, we need to do this one, we need to do that, and then they move with it, but not strategically. Not, it, it was not done strategically. That is what I'm trying to say. We should be strategic about what we are doing. And we, you know, with this kind of situation, we should have policies in place, like a policy of amelioration. There should be the, the government of Nigeria should be able to stand in a press conference somewhere within the United Nations or so, anywhere and say, okay, this is the policy that we are trying to we are trying to push forward, you know, in this Ukrainian-Russian war. We are pushing the policy of amelioration. How to ameliorate this situation? more like a, maybe not a peacekeeper, but how to ameliorate this situation so that the people will not suffer. And in that way, the world will begin to see Nigeria in a very different light. You can see, you can see that there is a lot of things going on. The embassies, the embassies are supposed to be put 
to work. The embassies are supposed to be put to work as like banks right now. They are supposed to be every, especially the diplomatic staff. They are supposed to be put to work right now to meet the different uh, uh, establishments, the different uh, institutions, the European Union institutions, to begin to ask them questions like, what can we do to help this situation that we are in? What can we do to help? You know, and by the time you begin to ask these questions, by the time you begin to have press conferences with these people, by the time you begin to talk to these people on a very high cadre of, of, of administrative uh, uh, a relationship or diplomatic relationship, you begin to see a kind of, you know, a reciprocal approach from them. They would want to provide you with information. They would want to tell you what you can do for them. They will want to talk to you about, you know, the gas shortages, uh, shortages that they have, especially Germany. I want to bring out something. Germany, you should work with Germany because of all the European Union uh, uh, countries, Germany has been very, very proactive and helpful to, to Nigerians. I have to tell you this. You, 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 you guys need to talk to the German. You need to invite the German ambassador. And you see, when you thank, when you make, when you thank people, they want to do more. They they understand that you appreciate them, and that is how to be diplomatic. That is how to be diplomatic. Let's all right, then, David. Uh, we've completely, we've what, completely. What, my what my apologies. We're we we're, we're, we're out of time now, David. Uh, but I'm sure those uh, who are in a position to to attend to this are listening, particularly the bit you said about. Uh, proactiveness and, and working together with those who are willing to help and those who are willing to cooperate with us. That is a very important point uh, that is uh, supposed to be emphasised in foreign policy. Uh, Osarume, yeah, yeah. David, Isabel, thank you so much for your time. Do continue to stay safe out of the uh, out there. Uh, I will get back to you at uh, at a time in the future. Thank you so much for your time. Thank this you, morning. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on the program, in sports, Athletics Integrity Unit finds Russian race walkers guilty of further doping offences. Please stay on with us. Thanks for staying tuned. Welcome back. Russia is planning to resume local bond sales after a six months pause. The Kremlin also reportedly wants Chinese yuan denominated debt to help the recovery of the Russian market. The report highlights that ruble bonds, also referred to as OFZs, uh, could potentially be back on the market in the second half of September. Meanwhile, the debut of the yuan bonds on the Russian market is unlikely to happen until uh, next year. According to Russian media, a long bill plan to debut Chinese currency notes locally has been dusted off with fresh urgency as UN trading volumes surge after sanctions shot Russia out of its traditional markets in the US and in uh, Europe. And there are concerns that the Arab world's most populous nation will fail to honor its debt and will remain front of mind for investors until there's clarity that Egypt will devalue its currency and an IMF package will be large enough to close its funding gap. It's been a wild ride for investors, as seen in the cost to ensure the country's bonds. The gauge remains elevated, hitting a record high 1,500 basis points last month, before moderating to around 940 basis points for the week ended on the 26th of August. But that's still higher than troublesome Turkey and Angola. Let's take a look at the other business stories emanating from this conflict. Here is Ini. Good morning, Ini. Let's, uh, let's begin with uh, Russia, Armenia, and Iran trading local currencies. Again, the Russians. Yes. Financial making, engineers. Making, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I, I, that's the best way to do it. Financial right? engineers. And I mean, I think they are, they, are gaming, they are gaining ground. So now we know that Iran, of course, was never a friend of the West. Right. So it's easy to have them on their side. Uh, but the thing now is that we see that the trade between both countries has increased. Yes. And they are using ruble. So, I mean, the ruble is gaining strength from that. Then you have Armenia. Uh, so 
So at first, when Armenia started trading aggressively with Russia, there were fears that the West would come after them. But you know, we've discussed here how sometimes yeah. it seems like the, the West is looking the other way. Yeah, we talked about it in Turkey and all of that. They're also looking the other way with Armenia. So now they're taking the relationship further by having by trading in local currencies. And uh, for now, they're using the ruble already. Armenia has opened that Gazprom uh, ruble yes. uh, account that they asked for. So... Other trades are also following with rubles. So what that means is the focus and dominance of dollar is constantly being threatened. You know, on Friday with Amarashi, we discussed how, um, what was that neighboring country uh, to Russia? No, to um, Ukraine. You know, that is friends with Russia. <laughs> okay. Oh, oh uh, um, <laughs> Belarus. <laughs> so they have also agreed, you understand, to do the ruble trade. They have also they also have a pact with Russia to also trade in rubles. So we see more countries agreeing to beyond the gas, the oil and gas, you know, which was to the do request. Actual trade. Actual trade. We have China, you know, I think you have that as part of your stories, 40% yeah. higher now. The trade between China uh, in, in local currencies with ruble, with the with Russia. You know, so we see constantly with the war still ongoing, the dominance of the dollar is being threatened. So maybe in, in the near future, I mean, they're talking about uh, the one, the one uh, uh, Euro bond. Yeah, bond exactly. Sales, yes. you, you see what I'm saying? So maybe if other countries also adopt this, countries like Egypt, because one of the problems with Egypt is because the dollar has been gaining. So because of that, their debt has been increasing right. because their debt is in dollar. So if they had it in perhaps their local currency or some other currency which is not as strong as the dollar, then there will not be the fear of them defaulting in their debt payment. So, uh, but, but I think one thing is clear here. I know at the beginning of the war when we had this conversation, a lot of people said, oh, there's no way the dollar is not uh, threatened. It's going to be dominant. Exactly. And not going to be yeah, but, but we are seeing it now. If you have some countries using the one, you saw the uh, lira, you know, all of that the That's ruble right. and all of that these are countries that used to depend solely on the dollar oh. shifting away from it and we still have the bricks coming on we don't know what uh, uh, policy is going to come now, from now with all of this and again for some people this might come as a surprise russian corporate profits mm -hmm. are up 25% i tell you i was i was surprised myself for the second quarter Russian corporate profits jumped 25%. Now, I mean... I have uh, to read that twice <laughs> to be sure that exactly, it was not a typo. Exactly, because some people have said, okay, so where are the corporate? I thought everybody had left. But even up, up until last week, we still had corporate who were saying, oh, they are planning to exit. So what that means, there are still some corporate that are quietly doing businesses in Russia and, you know, um, maybe because there's now less competition, so they are now gaining more grounds. That is also another perspective. But the profit jumped by 9.5 trillion rubles. That's $144 billion. Uh, manufacturing... Uh, uh, was hit. However, it's not all of them trading and retail because obviously people have left. So the people who used to buy and uh, people like McDonald's, uh, you know, all those ones. All those, of course, have, been yeah, have left, so, but they've been replaced by other people. I mean, Russians are still eating burgers. Still eating, they may not be McDonald's they are still eating burgers. Burgers. <laughs> <laughs> burgers and chips. Yeah, they may not be, they may not be McDonald's. But yeah, but burgers. manufacturing was hit. Actually, uh, it fell. It, uh, well, it still managed 44% profits in spite of that but much less than the previous year transportation and storage were however up uh, so perhaps people are, you know we talked about their new lander car locally yes. made yes. so all of those not are making very pretty but yeah but useful but useful then they we talked about uh, their plans about the aircrafts Indeed. you know and then the seized one they're they are still using yes which so is I, costing those who own that aircraft money much much I more mean, I, again <laughs> <laughs> these are these are things that uh, where we interesting have time times. To take. Yes, indeed. Inie, thank you so much <laughs> thank uh, for, you for that. Me. I just have the opportunity to take a bit of uh, sports news against uh, all odds. 
Russia's Alexander Morozova has won South Africa's 95th Comrades Marathon, the female category, uh, despite controversy in her competing in the race. Her entry and race number had been withdrawn from registration. Morozova lodged an urgent application at the Pieter Maritzburg High Court to appeal against the letter she received from the Comrades Marathon Association barring her from competing in accordance with the isolation of Russia and sports worldwide because of its invasion of Ukraine. Morozova, who is reliant on the prize money from such races, is expected to return to court in November to establish whether she's entitled to any prize money. In this congratulatory message, the ruling African Congress says Martsova should not be subjected to another court process to be entitled to her prize money because it was bad enough that she had to go to court to compete in the first place. And uh, just uh, before we go, Russia's race workers, Alexander Ivanov and Igor Shyarukin, have been found guilty of committing further anti-doping rule violations by the Athletics Integrity Unit. Ivanov has been handed a two-year period of ineligibility, which started on August the 25th, after data from the Moscow laboratory showed one of his samples contained substances which are judged to be hormone and metabolic modulators. It is the second time that Ivanov has been sanctioned for taking banned substances. Yerokin will face no additional consequences as a result of already serving a lifetime ban, which has seen all of his results from February 25th, 2011, disqualified. He had originally served a two-year period of ineligibility from September 2008 to September 2010 before receiving a lifetime ban on August 28, 2013 for further infringements of anti-doping rules. Thanks for being with us. That's our program this morning. My name is Ladi Akiri Duluali. There's an update on the world today at five. But until then, you have yourselves a pleasant start to the week. Good morning.